actually meet all of you. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my presentation. Okay, I'm sharing now. So um, can people see this okay on your end? Yes, we can. You can see this. Okay, great. So please just, uh, if you have any questions or anything technical uh, issues uh, spring up, please let me know and I'll stop and we can um, fix them. Okay, so yeah, I'll, I'll get started um, with the, the subject for tonight, which is a revolution in planet formation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit tonight about how the ALMA telescope, which you've heard a little bit about already, uh, has really enabled us to learn a lot of fascinating new things about how planets form. Okay. So to get started, my talk is going to be structured uh, as such. I'm first going to start with a general overview for why we should care about planet formation in general, and then talk a little bit about the details about how do we think uh, planets actually form? What are the processes? What are the mechanisms? And what are the theories behind planet formation? And then I'm going to connect that with some observational evidence and particularly bring in ALMA and these new observations that have let, let us test and validate some of these theories of planet formation. And in particular, these are the areas that are closest to my own research. And then lastly, I'm just going to end with some future prospects, specifically focus, focusing on what JWST is going to add to the picture and how I really think that we, the studies of planet formation are have a very bright future to go. Okay, so first, I just want to start with why do we why do we care about this subject? And I always like to start with this image here. So this is an image taken with the Cassini spacecraft looking back at Earth. So those few pixels right there in the center of the image, that's us. That's all of Earth. We're sitting in those, those little pixels. And I think that really just frames the story of planet formation well, because we're on a planet, right? We had to, the planet had to form, Earth had to be there for us to exist, for life to exist. But also in this photo, uh, we also get to see another planetary phenomena, right? We can see Saturn's rings frame very nicely, which is another consequence of planet formation, having rings around certain planets. And I just want to stress to all of you that I think this is a particularly special time for those people that are studying both planetary and astronomical sciences. And that's because of two things. The first is we are now getting a very unique and detailed view of our own solar system. We're learning new things in detail about the bodies in our solar system that we've never been able to do before. And we're also at the very same time getting ever increasing amounts of data on exoplanets. So that is planets around other stars. And we're just detecting more and more with time. So we're essentially broadening our view of what types of planets can exist. And we're also focusing in and learning more and more about our own planets in our backyard. And so when we put all of this together, we have a, such a wealth of data, and this is going to give us a, a unique set of opportunities to learn some new things, but also some new challenges. And so I just want to spend a few moments uh, talking about these two sides of the coin. So first, I'll focus on our solar system and why we have this new detailed view. And this is really because of NASA's missions. So here I'm just showing a gallery of NASA's operating and future science fleet. And you can see the different colors here correspond to the different types of missions. So those that are around the Earth are green, the solar missions, heliophysics missions are in yellow, and then uh, the planetary missions are in purple, astrophysics in blue, and so forth. And so just the thing that impresses me is how many different spacecraft are out there studying our universe launched by NASA. It's always a bit overwhelming to look at this uh, gallery. And so I really just want to focus in on two of these particular missions. That is the New Horizons and Osiris Rex, and to just use them as sort of the the representative examples for how we've been able to push the boundaries here. The first, which uh, hopefully many of you are already familiar with, would be the New Horizons mission. This was to Pluto, um, out in the Kuiper Belt. And prior to the New Horizons flyby mission, this was the best image that we had of Pluto taken with one of our very great astrophysics telescopes, the Hubble Space Telescope in 2010. But you can see uh, the image is pretty blurry. There's maybe some color differentiation occurring in the south, but it's very, very hard to tell. And if you compare this to the image that we got with actually sending a spacecraft to fly by Pluto, we see a spectacular improvement here. This is the image from New Horizons taken in July 2015, and you can very 
clearly see the geological features. You could see the color variation that we was maybe hinted at a bit in the Hubble image very plainly here. And not only this, but you can then zoom in and look at geological features. So on the left here is showing a large ice volcano on Pluto. Uh, the right is showing a, uh, this is an image with six mile resolution. So it's showing an icy crater plane. And so these are just fantastic in detail views of a, of a body that is so far away from us, but we can still look at things that are on the scale of miles. So we're doing geology on other worlds. I also want to mention the uh, OSIRIS-REx mission. This was to the asteroid, so uh, asteroid Bennu. It's a little bigger than the Empire State Building, shown here for scale. And what's fantastic about this mission was that it was actually a sample return. So NASA sent a mission that actually went to OSIRIS, it went to uh, uh, asteroid Bennu, and you can see the uh, sa the sample collector here impacting Bennu. And then the material from the asteroid is getting stuck inside the sample holder, and it's being then brought back here to Earth uh, for detailed analysis. So we're actually bringing a piece of this asteroid back to Earth for study. And it's quite timely because this uh, mission actually just returned to Earth. Here's a picture of the landing um, from the OSIRIS-REx mission in Utah this year, uh, September. And so the initial indications are that the material here contains uh, water and some of life uh, ingredients important for life. But we'll hear a lot more about this in the next few years, I, I'm sure. And um, these, it, these two missions really just demonstrate that now we're actually being able to do very detailed studies on bodies in our own solar system and actually bringing material home to us to study. So I would also be uh, remiss in not showing these wonderful JWST images because JWST, we often think of as this galaxy hunting machines going back to very high redshifts. Um, but JWST has also been used to look at our solar system bodies in unprecedented detail. So you can see the gallery of gas giants here taken at infrared wavelengths with JWST. So very beautiful images of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And just to zoom in on one of these, here's the family portrait of Jupiter. Um, with JWST, where you can see the northern and the southern aurora. You can see the presence of rings and a few of the moons here, which is just a spectacular quality and a spectacular view of planets in our own solar system at the in infrared wavelengths that we've never been able to see before with this resolution, thanks to JWST. Okay, so in addition to that, on the other side of, of the coin here, we get these really wonderful views of a few planets in our solar system in detail. What's also happening, as has been happening over the last few decades or so in astronomy, is this discovery of many, many exoplanets. So I like to frame this by looking at imagining a picture of the night sky here. And this is showing the field of view of the Kepler mission, which stared at this patch of sky uh, for many, many years. And what Kepler was able to find is that he, what you really should think about when you look at every patch of light, every star out there, is you should think about planets. Uh, planets are incredibly common. Almost every star is going to have a planet. And so here is showing the, some real data from Kepler where we now colored the different types of planets uh, around each star. So those that are Earth size are blue, and the ones that are more giant are, are red or orange. But the biggest takeaway from this era of exoplanets that we now live in is just the number that we've seen. So here's a, a plot that's showing the cumulative number of exoplanets that we've detected um, as a function of year. And you can see for detect our first exoplanet in 1992, and then in, within a decade or two, this, this curve just goes exponential. And at this point now, we can draw a line at 5,000. We've seen more than 5,000 confirmed exoplanets and expect this curve to just continue up. We're only going to ever detect more and more over the next few years and to the foreseeable future. But besides just detecting these planets, um, what can we learn? So one way to look at a subset of these planets that we have some more information about. So what we can do is every point here is a confirmed exoplanet in gray. The x-axis is showing the period of that planet or how long it takes to go around its star, which is essentially proportional to how far away it is from its star. And the y-axis here is showing the planet's mass in terms of Earth masses. And so there's two things I want you to take away from this plot from what we've been able to find so far with having these 5,000 plus exoplanets is that first look at how 
wide the range is in both the x-axis and the y-axis. We have planets that have very, very short periods and those that have very, very long periods, spanning many factors of 10. And same thing in the y-axis, many factors of 10. You have a planet, you have many, some planets that are less than Earth mass, and then you have others that are many thousands of times more massive than Earth. So we see a very diverse set of planets out there. But the second thing I want to point out is if we put the location of the solar system planets onto this same plot, what you'll notice is they're quite distinct. They're in separate regions of this plot. The planets that we've been detecting around other stars uh, so far don't look that similar to our own solar system. Some of this is an intrinsic difference. Some of this is that our detection methods are a bit biased uh, towards detecting things that look like our solar system that are very far out or that are very small earth sized or, or less. But nonetheless, it suggests that there's this huge diversity of planets out there and our solar system is just one possible result of forming planets. To really drive that point home, here's the same plot and I've just colored a few different regions. Um, there are some planets out there that like this planet here, 50 feet, 55 Cancri E, uh, that are lava worlds that the side that faces their star is hot enough to melt iron um, and it is likely a carbon planet, something totally exotic to us. There are other planets in this blue region here, which are a little bigger than Earth, but incredibly low density and are likely water worlds. There are others like this uh, purple point here in the hot Jupiter's section, which are Jupiter's, they're the size of Jupiter or many, si many times the size of Jupiter and they're very close to their central star, so they're hot. And when I say very close, I mean that they might have periods that are less than one day. So they're just rapidly, rapidly flying around their central star. And we have no, absolutely no analog for a hot Jupiter in our own solar system. And so the key takeaway that we should have from this is really that any theory of planet formation must not only be able to make our own solar system, but it has to be able to explain this huge diversity of planets that we've now found um, in these exoplanetary systems. Okay, so I wanna move a little bit now, since this, things are, are framed a little bit into the details of how do planets actually form? So what are our first theories and what do we think about uh, now in the modern day? So starting at the beginning, the initial idea for how planets or, or forms uh, dates back to something called the nebular hypothesis. And the nebular hypothesis was initially articulated back in the 1700s, actually, by some very famous uh, thinkers and philosophers that you may recognize, Swedenborg, Kant, Laplace. And so what I've done is just extracted some text from uh, Laplace here from 1796 that just sort of distills the, the idea that they were thinking about several hundreds of years ago. And um, what this text says is this nebula, which they mean just some gas cloud, a uh, cloud of, of dust and gas, extending far beyond the orbit of the outermost planet, gradually contracted by its own gravitation, the angular rotary velocity necessarily increasing and the polar diameter diminishing as it contracted. By successive repetitions of this process, other rings eventually formed the nearly circular masses of the planets. And so we translate this into modern English, we get a cloud of gas and dust collapses due to its own gravity, and then it forms a disk, which we now call a protoplanetary disk, and from which the planets are then formed. And so what's particularly striking about this nebular hypothesis is that it's not that far off our modern picture of planet formation. Uh, our modern picture goes something like this, as represented in this schematic here, where you have a cold cloud of gas and dust, which in regions within that cloud of gas and dust uh, are slightly over dense. Because they're over dense, you have more gravity and this gravity contracts and eventually forms a young star or protostar. Because the densities are high enough, the, the material keeps falling in, that protostar goes brighter and brighter. And eventually you actually form a, a disk around that young protostar. And that's something we call the protoplanetary disk where planets will form. And then in another five to 10 million years, all the material is cleared and you have a, a fully fledged solar system. So it's particularly striking that the ideas from you know, 200, 250 years ago essentially got it right. Sure, there's some details here, but the, the main idea was correct. Uh, and I'll just walk through this one more time, just in, in a video format. 
um, to just drive home this, this standard picture we have now. We have a cold cloud of gas and dust. These regions here are over dense regions, so we're going to zoom into one. Things are now contracting due to their own gravity. They're getting hotter and denser at the center, and eventually have a star form. And from this star, you actually see some jets from stellar activity. But the main thing to focus on is now you have a disk of material forms around that star. And this is the disk that we call a protoplanetary disk, because planets are going to form in this disk. And you can see that, that directly here. The planets are carving out material. So as they form, they take up material. Uh, other material gets expelled um, due to stellar winds. And so eventually, after this process proceeds for several million years, all of that loose gas and dust in the disk is eventually dissipated. And you have something that just looks like our, our solar system now. OK, so this particular phase, that of the protoplanetary disk, is something near and dear to my heart. It's, it's what I study. But I also think it's it's the most interesting and important part of this sequence, because if you really want to understand how you get our solar system or how you get the myriad of exoplanets that we see, you really want to focus in on this phase, because in this disk is when you're forming your planets, and it's where they're getting their composition. It's where they're getting their atmospheres. It's what's setting their final masses, their locations. All of this is determined in the protoplanetary disk phase. And so I think it is the most important phase to, to study to make those connections with fully formed planets. And what you should really think about is you go from a disk full of gas and dust, and, that all, and then eventually all of that gas and dust gets uh, used to make planets, and eventually all of it is dispersed and gone. So we're looking at this sort of transition, this phase of evolution to make planets. And just one thing I, I want to note, um, as you saw in the video, initially the collapse was pretty spherical, um, but at the end we form a disk. And so why is, the, why is that the case? And this is just due to the conservation of angular momentum, that we need to get lots of material um, onto the central star. And to do this most efficiently, we're going to end up forming a flattened, quickly rotating disk from that initial diffuse, slowly rotating cloud. And we see evidence for this in um, other systems and in our own solar system. So if you look out in the night sky, you might notice many of the planets, as shown here, all lie on the ecliptic plane. They lie on this relatively uh, coplanar region. Um, we can see Venus, Mars, Jupiter. And this initial uh, uh, pla plane-like nature of our planets just goes back to the disk in which they formed. OK, so to get into the little bit of the details about actually making a planet. So I showed you this broad picture and scenario, but how do we actually make something that looks like the Earth? And so the whole story of planet formation is actually a story of dust. And so, excuse me, um, what we have here is a roadmap for dust. And we start with very small particles, those that are micron or submicron sized. These are the size of uh, you know, your, your hair, or a, a hair particle. And we have to then grow that dust particle the whole way up to something that's the size of Earth or even Jupiter. And so what you can see here is the process that dust takes as it grows to larger and larger bodies to eventually get to uh, something that looks like the Earth. So I'm just going to walk through a few of these important stages in the evolution of dust in this protoplanetary disk. So the first step is to take that very, very fine dust, micron, submicron, and grow it into something we call pebbles. And so this is something like this, a particle that looks uh, basically like you know smoke, little fine particulate dust into something that looks like a pebble that's a millimeter or a centimeter in size. And it turns out people have modeled this, and it turns out they just stick together. So if you have two aggregates of micron-sized dust, they run into each other in the dense environment in the protoplanetary disk, you end up with something that is naturally bigger. The result of the collision, they're going to lose some of the material, but the end uh, conglomeration of dust is bigger than, than either one of the individual uh, pieces that collided together. So it turns out that this stage of making pebbles in disks is actually pretty well solved. We can just have them stick together. But Beyond this, then we need to go from pebbles, which you should think of as just sort of rocks, 
uh, we need to grow that into something that's like an Earth-like planet. And this is a this is a harder process to do, as you can imagine. Um, if you follow the sequence here, you're going to go from pebbles to something called a planetesimal. Planetesimals are just mini planets. They're on their way to being planets, but they're they're too small to be fully planets. Some of those planetesimals will just end up as things that we're familiar with in our own solar system, like asteroids or comets. Other planetesimals will continue to collide and grow uh, to form bigger bodies like the Earth. But there's a big question mark here. There's uh, lots of disagreement still in the field. This is an area of active research for how you actually take something like a pebble and you make it into a planet. Because you're going from something that is a millimeter or a centimeter size the whole way up to hundreds or thousands of kilometers. And so to just really drive that point home, dust in the disk is really has to go from microns to kilometers. It has to go 13 orders of magnitude. So this is a huge amount of scales we have to jump over. But if you can imagine this process, just taking two rocks and throwing them together, and they're not really going to want to stick, right? They're just going to bounce off each other. They're not going to grow much larger. So I'll just present two possible solutions to, to this, how you jump over this, uh, this barrier here. One is actually to use ice. And so here is the typical uh, distribution of a protoplanetary disk, where you have a warm inner region, and then you have a much colder outer disk. And so there's this region between uh, the warm inner disk and the cold outer disk that we call the frost line. Beyond the frost line, the temperatures are so cold that a lot of the gas has condensed or, or frozen out. And so this actually offers a solution to this problem of growing larger, larger dust, because instead of taking two rocks, what you can imagine is taking two snowballs, right? Two ice-coated dust grains and throwing them together. And you're going to have a much better time sticking two snowballs together than you are going to have two bare rocks. So provided that you're planetesimals or your planets are forming out in this cold outer disk where you just take snowballs and throw them together, it effectively lets you grow larger and larger bodies beyond bare rocks. One other solution to this problem is actually to use uh, gas pressure traps. So that's if you have a particular gap in your uh, dust gas distribution. So here, that's actually shown in the, in the red curve here. If you put a particular dip, uh, so say if there's some radius in your disk where you, you don't have a lot of gas, you can actually end up co uh, collecting dust particles on either side of that. And you end up with a lot of them in a very small region. And so the things can just very quickly collapse due to gravity. So essentially the picture you should have in this case is you end up trapping a lot of dust particles in a very thin region like this. And if you're able to trap a bunch of particles, then they can quickly leap over this uh, meter or millimeter sized barrier and just immediately grow to a very large size body by just direct collapsing because the gravity is so intense. Now, this is just two scenarios. People have worked up other ones. Uh, we must be able to grow to large bodies because we are here, but this is definitely an, an open area of research. Things get a little better once we get to something that is the size of the Earth or, or so. We know how we can grow from an Earth-like body the whole way up to something like a Neptune or a Jupiter. And that's because once we have that rocky core, um, what needs to happen is that the surrounding gas has to be accreted onto that rocky core. And so to make something like a Jupiter, what you do is you start out with this rocky core that is maybe the size of Earth or so. That mass is sufficiently large enough that it's going to trigger runaway accretion or accumulation of the surrounding hydrogen and helium gas in the disk. And so what ends up actually happening is that you end up forming a smaller mini disk around this initial rocky core, where the gas is accumulating, accreting onto the surface. And in this disk, you actually can then form moons. So it's essentially another disk. Instead of having a big disk, you're having a much smaller mini disk around the individual planets that let them grow to be giant gas giants, and also ex explains how you could have then moons forming around those gas giants in just a very much scaled down version of the larger protoplanetary disk. And we call these circumplanetary disks because they are planetary, they're around a planet and circum just around that planet. 
So one thing I, I do want to mention is that all of this planet formation processes, everything that I've just described, that roadmap for the dust in your disk is actually happening very quickly, at least on astronomical timescales. This whole process of forming your planets are, are over by 10 million years. And it might be even shorter. It might only take a few million years in, in, in a few cases. And compared to how long stars live, this is incredibly quick. So here I'm just showing the average lifetime of a few different types of stars. So if you're a star like our sun, you're uh, one solar mass. If you look at the, the table here, you're going to live for 10 billion years. So you compare 10 billion years in terms of a stellar lifetime to the few million years it takes to make planets. So essentially planet formation is occurring in the blink of an eye relative to how long these stars live. If you're a planet forming around a very low mass star, maybe a 10th of our uh, sun, which is a much more common type of star out there, then that star is going to live for hundreds of billions of years, thousands of billions of years. Okay, so to, to dive in a little bit into the details of these protoplanetary disks, I just want to show you where the planet formation is actually happening. So I've just been gen generically referring to this disk structure, but here's what it looks like. So you end up having a central star in the middle, and then you have material surrounding that central star out to maybe a hundred AU or so. For, for reference, the one AU is the distance from the, the Earth and the Sun. And this, this scale, uh, 30 to 50 AU, it is like the Kuiper belt in our solar system. So these are comparable in size. The planet forming zone actually is coming in the, in the middle of this disk, what we something we call the midplane. And that's because that's where the millimeter size particles, that's the big particles have settled down into the midplane, and they're colliding with each other just in that region there. All throughout this process, you're actually having material accreting onto your central star because at the same time your planets are forming, your star is also continuing to grow bigger and bigger. So in a sense that there is some competition here between the, the material in your disk, some of it will be incorporated into your planets, and some of it will be incorporated into the star or be blown off as the star gets brighter and brighter. So that's one reason planet formation has to happen so quickly. If it takes too long, the material will all be gone and there'll be no way to actually make your planet. In your disks, you have essentially four main ingredients, which are shown here. You have some hot gas close to your star uh, within a few AU. Outside of that, you have a cold reservoir of gas. Um, this is mostly molecular hydrogen. You have two different, generically, two different dust populations. One we call the large dust, which is mostly millimeter-sized grains. They're the bigger particles you see here. And you notice they're all in the midplane. That's where I said planet formation is occurring in that midplane region because they grow to this large size, and then they get heavy. And because they're heavy, they just sink. And they sink down, and they sit in the midplane. Whereas this small dust, which is more of the micron size particles, they're so small, it hasn't grown large enough. So it's happy to couple with the gas and you just see it throughout the whole disk. It's not heavy enough to sink yet. So for the rest of this talk, I'm mostly going to be focusing on this large dust because it's this large dust that is the reservoir for planets. These are already particles, dust particles that have grown big enough that they're starting the along that roadmap of dust that I showed you before. Okay, so let's jump then into the, the next uh, topic, which is observational evidence, right? I've shown you a lot of theory and schematics, but how do we actually know this is the case? How have we validated all of these theories? And what role does ALMA have to play in this process? So to just walk you through a little bit of the history here, uh, the d discovery of these protoplanetary disks was, was actually many decades ago, and it was it was done via this extra emission. So in the top panel here, you see the characteristic brightness of just a star um, as a function of wavelength. So it follows this very uh, characteristic curve, uh, black body curve is what it's called, and it's just related to the temperature of the star. But it turns out when you have extra material around your star, you see the presence of extra emission, just shown right here. It doesn't follow the exact black body curve. There is more brightness, there's more light at these longer wavelengths because that's being emitted by the disk itself. And so this was the telltale sign that let people first discover 
and detect these disks. They found this extra emission that couldn't be explained just by a star itself. So then they knew, oh, there had to be material around that star. So to drive that point home, here's just the, the same plot showing you the yellow contribution here is from the star, and the red contribution here is from the protoplanetary disk. Again, showing the, the brightness that you'd expect as a function of wavelength, wavelength getting bigger as you go to the right. And here's what some of the actual data looked like back um, several decades ago. This is what we do. We just basically take an image at multiple different wavelengths, measure how bright it was. Each one of those are the, the gray black points here. And then we'd fit a model for the star, which is shown in gray. And clearly that doesn't fit the data that well, right? There's some more emission out at longer wavelengths. And that's how we knew there was a disk there. So this is great. It's a great method for detecting disks. And we can learn maybe a little bit about the disk. Um, how bright the extra emission was would tell us how much dust there is there. But the problem is going beyond this is very difficult with just having some points on a plot like this. Uh, we don't get any spatial information, right? We can just say there's a disk there or there's not a disk there. And so how we've been able to make progress over the last 20 years is really two things. It's the development of these radio interferometers that observe at millimeter wavelengths. So I'm going to talk a little bit about both of these things and why they've enabled huge advancements in this field. The first one is actually observing at millimeter wavelengths. And so when I say millimeter wavelengths, I mean light that has a wavelength that's the size of, of about a millimeter. For instance, um, as you all know, if you look at different astrophysical objects uh, at different wavelengths, they're going to emit differently. So here is the Taurus molecular cloud, a giant molecular cloud of gas and dust. The optical image shown here on the left, what you see is just a dark lane. Uh, it's blocking out stars behind it because the stellar light in the optical is being absorbed by the dust. And so what you're just seeing is these dark lanes that correspond to Taurus. But in the millimeter, you see a totally different story. What you see here is that the Taurus molecular cloud is actually lighting up. It's emitting very strongly. So this is a totally complementary view where you can actually very easily trace the uh, extent of this molecular cloud if you look at these longer wavelengths not using optical. And you might ask, why is this the case? Why is it blocked out in optical? And why is it so strong in a millimeter? And what you're actually seeing is the dust. The dust is actually giving off emission. It's giving off light at these wavelengths. Because this dust has a temperature of around 20 Kelvin, so that's only 20 Kelvin above absolute zero, so cold by our standards, but still pretty warm relative to the background of space. And so just because the dust is at this temperature, it gives off some set of characteristic radiation. Its black body radiation, though, is not in the optical like a star is. It's very hot. It's occurring in the millimeter. And so if we use millimeter wavelengths, we can look at this hot dust emission, uh, 20 Kelvin dust emission. So. What we should think about is in disks, it's actually these very same uh, dust particles. They are also around 20 Kelvin. They're also giving off thermal emission that we can observe very much just like this molecular cloud here. And to remind you, it's this millimeter sized particles in the midplane of the disk that is our planet forming material. So we really want to be able to go and detect that. And um, why we want to look at, at, at millimeter wavelengths, just to, to sort of uh, uh, go over this one more time, um, every particular portion of the electromagnetic spectrum from the radio to the, the gamma rays um, will correspond to some particular temperature of the body giving uh, emitting that, that light. And so if you're a very cold object, you'll be at the radio. If you're a hot object, you'll be up at the X-ray or the gamma ray. And so if we just look right where 20 Kelvin is here, which is right about here where we do our observations, that puts you at a particular wavelength of the millimeter um, millimeter wavelengths. OK, so now that we want to observe at the millimeter, we can do that um, with modern technology. But what about uh, the size of these disks? So I said before that most of these disks are around 100 AU or so. And so how we calculate the resolution of our telescope is given something like this. Uh, it's proportional to the wavelength over the diameter of the telescope. So lambda here is the wavelength you're observing at. In this case, that has to be fixed to be millimeter. Uh, the diameter here is of your particular dish that you're using to do this. 
And for scale, we need to be able to resolve. If we want to make an image, we want to be able to resolve something that it's 100 AU or so, which is the typical size of these protoplanetary disks. To just compare that to something like the Taurus molecular cloud here, which is light years or hundreds of thousands of AU in, in size. So these planet forming disks are pretty small. So the solution to this perhaps is to just go to the largest dishes that we have. So what happens if we do that? Here's two examples. The first one is the IRAM 30 meter uh, telescope in Spain, 30 meter dish, pretty big. Uh, if we calculate using that formula, we find that it has a resolution of over a thousand AU at millimeter wavelengths. So this is far too big. We'd never see our disk. What about going to Green Bank, um, which is actually not too far away from where I am now uh, in West Virginia. It has a dish of 100 meters. But even at 100 meters, the resolution is, is too poor. We only see things that are uh, the size of 400 AU. We can't see anything smaller than 400 AU, even with this huge telescope. So it seems like we can't build an individual dish that is big enough to actually look at these protoplanetary disks. So, but we have a solution for this. And this is if you link telescopes together. And this is using a technique called radio interferometry. And interferometry, because it exploits the interference properties of light. So if you have an astrophysical source and that source is then you know, emitting light and we build two telescopes as part of this uh, interferometric array, that light is going to arrive with a very small time delay depending on the position of the antenna in your array, right? If the, if the antenna, one antenna will be slightly closer or slightly further away. And if you have a supercomputer, they can actually measure these very, very tiny differences in time. You can actually use that to then calculate the position of your source. And if you have many antennas, you get a better position, uh, better position information about your astrophysical source. If you have more telescopes, you actually, you have more collecting area. So that means you can detect fainter things. And every measurement here is actually occurring between every pair of telescopes, which we, we call a baseline. And so in practice, here's a, an example for the NOEMA uh, interferometer in the French Alps. And so what you should think about is each pair of antennas like this are making a measurement. They're looking at your source, you're calculating the time delay, and you're correlating all of that in your supercomputer to say what where that source is on the sky. And since you have uh, eight antenna here, you're doing that for all of the different ones. And so you get fairly accurate uh, positional information and you have eight antennas, so you get a lot of collecting area. And just as an aside, for those that are familiar with the EHT or the Event Horizon Telescope, this was exactly the same technique that they used to image the black hole uh, M87 here. Basically using an interferometer the size of the Earth, linking all of these different telescopes together. Okay, so that brings me to ALMA. Um, ALMA is the, the world's premier millimeter interferometer. It's the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Uh, ALMA, or, or SOL in, in Spanish, it is 66 antennas in the north of Chile. So on a map, this is where you should be thinking, uh, up here in the Atacama Desert uh, in Chile. It is the most expensive ground-based astronomical project uh, ever, cost over a billion US dollars. But what you get for that is actually a telescope that has a better spatial resolution by a factor of five than that of the Hubble Space Telescope. This is the site where ALMA is located on a very high plateau. So this is at seven, well, nearly 17,000 feet in elevation. And this is because we want to be above most of the water vapor in the atmosphere, because the water vapor tends to absorb these millimeter, this millimeter light that we want to see. What's particularly interesting about ALMA is it's also a dynamic telescope. The, each array or each antenna in the array can be moved around. So each one of these 66 antennas can be actually transported with a big machine that I'm showing here. So it's a, it's a dynamic, it's not just one fixed array, it can be moved constantly. But the most important thing is that you can put the telescopes at very far distances from each other. And you can make baselines that are 10 miles apart. That means the furthest you can separate your telescopes is 10 miles. And what that does is it gives you a resolution of under one at you. So no longer are we faced with those problems of resolution with a single big telescope, because we can just take our ar arrays and put them very far apart and then make images with resolutions that are better than the distance from um, the sun to the earth.
And what is the consequence of this? So to show you, here is a image of the large dust, the millimeter dust in the disk around HL tau. This is an image with the best uh, radio interferometers before ALMA. And here is the image with ALMA. So you can see a spectacular improvement. You're going from essentially a blob to something that shows very clearly the presence of rings and gaps. So every bright region here is a ring. Every dark region here is a gap. And this is in the planet forming material on these disks. So we're seeing actually that there is dust in certain locations and there's not dust in other locations, something we would have never been able to see with these previous images. And Alma has actually been able to upgrade this and take an even better image just this last year. And it looks even more spectacular. To give you an idea of what you're looking at here in terms of size, uh, these are the orbits of where Uranus and Neptune would be shown in uh, green and blue, respectively. So very comparable to something on the scale of our own solar system. And to just uh, go back to that artist's rendition of planet formation, we can see an analogy here, right? Where we can see actually these rings and gaps now for the first time in real astronomical observations. So it's very tempting to say that we have planets sitting in each one of these gaps that have actually carved out each one of the gaps because that material is now part of a planet and it's not just floating there anymore in space. And it turns out that we could go back and ask, okay, is HL Tau special, right? Did we just get lucky? Did we just look at this one system? It has lots of rings and gaps, but that's abnormal. But it turns out, no. We have, recent surveys have actually shown that this substructure, the presence of all these rings and gaps in the dust, is common. Pretty much any protoplanetary disk that we look at exhibits these same very same features. And in fact, we see even more diversity. So if you squint here at some of these images, you can actually see, in addition to the rings and gaps, you see some of the uh, disks actually have spiral arms. Other disks have clumps of materials on one side of the disk and not on the other. So you have local concentrations of dust on one side of the disk and not in the other. So we're seeing that this sort of substructure in the, in the dust in the, these disks is, is incredibly common. And again, these are all on the scale of 100 AU or so, something that we could only ever do with the spatial resolution of ALMA. But what's particularly exciting about this is if we take that interpretation that each gap is carved by a planet, we can infer properties of what kind of planets it would take to carve out that gap. And so at all of the uh, orange points here are planet properties inferred from those gaps in the, in the disks. So again, this is the same sort of exoplanet plot I showed before where you have on the x-axis the distance from the star, on the y-axis how massive the planet is, and every one of these orange points were directly inferred from that gallery of images I showed you in the previous slide. And what's really powerful about this is it actually lets us go to parts of parameter space that are hard to do with these traditional exoplanet detection methods, right? We fill in a portion of this plot that's not really filled in well by these other types of methods, these other colors here. So we're seeing new types of planets in the disks that we've not, not been able to see elsewhere. One uh, important point to make, though, is that you could imagine two scenarios. One where you have a disk like this, you have three prominent gaps, and you put one small or medium-sized planet in each gap that creates it. But models have also shown that you can reproduce the same observations by actually taking one large planet and putting it in, and it ends up carving the biggest gap, and then it causes all of the other gaps to form later. So there is this confusion potentially between multiple small planets and one large planet. They can reproduce both of these. Um, and so we're still trying to sort out which one of these is at play. But that raises one natural question. Can we actually use ALMA to directly detect a planet that is forming? And so for this, I just want to introduce this one disk called PDS-70. It's a particularly large protoplanetary disk. You can see here it's 140 AU in size but it has this very giant gap in the middle that's labeled here. The central star is blocked out by a chronograph. That's why there's this, there's this black region. Um, so it's essentially just masked out. But this large gap here uh, made people think more than 10 years ago now, um, we should, there might be a planet here, right? This is such a large gap. We probably have a planet in there carving out that gap. And it turns out when we used ALMA, uh, yes, we detected not only one, but two planets directly uh, as shown here. There, one is labeled PDS-70B here in the south, and then PDS-70C sort of to the, uh, to the right here. And so two planets were directly observed with ALMA inside of this giant gap. 
And this remains the first and really most definitive identification of planets still forming in their protoplanetary disk. And what you're actually seeing is you're seeing dust around both of those planets. It's still forming, dust is still being accumulated by those planets. And to just uh, bring this uh, you know, system in, into a full view, we can add a few more telescopes here, uh, looking at multi-wavelength data, but this is what we have. We have an inner disk, then a giant gap, two planets sitting in that giant gap, and then an outer disk outside of that. And actually, if we look at PDS 70C, we actually have evidence now of the first moon forming disk. So if you remember when I said we're forming giant planets, we end up getting a smaller mini disk uh, around that planet. That's exactly what we're seeing here for the first time in observations. So the picture you should have in your head is when you look at the observation here, this is what we're seeing. That bright point in the middle is this giant rocky planet and all of the fuzz around it is this much smaller moon forming or circumplanetary disk. And so we expect moons to actually be forming inside of this fuzzy material here. And this is absolutely state of the art. This is pushing all as far as you possibly can. Um, but we're, now we're actually able to detect planets and potentially even detect these small moon forming disks. And so I just want to uh, bring this all back to that initial plot of cumulative number of exoplanets as a function of year. And now to note that there is one new type of technique we've added onto this. The colors were all different types of uh, exoplanet detection techniques, but now we can actually go ahead and detect planets in disks themselves. The bar is too small to actually see here. We've, we've only done it you know, for a few cases so far, but this is just the beginning. Now we have ALMA, we can actually go detect planets directly in their disks and give us a whole new way uh, to look at these very youngest of exoplanets. And okay, in the last few minutes, I just want to finish up by looking forward. And here I'm just going to focus on JWST and show you just very briefly two quick results that uh, really uh, make me excited about the, the future. And all of these results are going to be in about the inner terrestrial zone of these disks. So turns out ALMA is great for larger scales, but it still can't see into the region where we expect terrestrial planets to form. When I say terrestrial planets, I mean Earth. Like if we want to go find an Earth analog, something, another planet that looks like Earth that's at one AU from its star, ALMA is still not sensitive enough to see that. But it turns out JWST is. And JWST is actually perfectly suited to look at that hot gas in that inner one or two AU. Uh, because that gas is sufficiently hot, it's very close to its central star. It's going to emit in the infrared. And JWST is an infrared facility. And so it's perfect to be able to observe that. We would never be able to see this gas with ALMA because ALMA observes at longer wavelengths. Uh, the gas is too hot for it. But with this with JWST, uh, which is just getting started in terms of looking at disks, we've seen two very exciting things. The first one is the detection of water vapor in this very same PDS-70 disk, that same disk where we know that definitively there are two planets imaged with ALMA. Uh, what we've been able to see is that in the innermost region, in that, that fuzz, that inner disk, um, people pointed at JWST and uh, took some spectra. And what they found is that there was uh, plentiful water in the inner region here. So all of the blue lines in this spectra here are different transitions from water. So these are the fingerprints of, of water vapor. And it was found to be particularly abundant. We know water is very important for formation of, of life, or we're on, we have oceans on the Earth here. And so in these same disks, um, we might have the same conditions um, uh, around something that would be 1 or 2 AU. Also, uh, around this other system, this is a, a spectrum with JWST around a star that is only a tenth of the mass of our sun. Um, and what you see here, every peak here is a, a different line from a different molecule. But the main thing to take away is the one that I've highlighted here in red is showing the presence of uh, hydrocarbons, particularly of a benzene ring. So this is an incredibly compl complex molecule, at least by astronomical standards, um, which is showing that even in these low mass stars and these low mass disks, uh, the chemical complexity is very high. So if you're going to say, are the chemical ingredients for life out there around earth analogs and other disks? have some very compelling evidence to say yes with JWST. And we really only are getting started. 
So I, I think there's really a bright future for probing what the gas conditions are like in that terrestrial zone uh, in the next few years. And I hope that you'll, you'll hear a lot more from JWST in the next five years or so. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll just wrap up. The, the big picture here is that we know planets form from gas and dust in protoplanetary disks. And ALMA has really been transformative to let us actually make images of this for the first time and really study this process in unprecedented detail. Um, but JWST will come along, has come along. It's going to open up new windows. And really, them working together, ALMA with JWST, uh, there's going to be a pretty bright future for planet formation. And I think we're, we're just getting started. All right, uh, I'll end there. And uh, thanks, thanks for listening. Happy to take uh, any questions. All right, any questions? <laughs> yeah, if you got sing it out and I'll ask it again. <laughs> Or, or come up here. Just uh, can you hear us talking right here? Uh, yes, I can hear you there. Yeah. You are an expert in exoplanetary discovery. One of my questions, and it's it's pretty simple. Do you have a favorite? Is there one of these exoplanets that you really like? That's my question. Oh, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, yes, uh, there, there is. So it's, it's, it, it doesn't have a fun name. It's called HD 169142B. Um, it's one of these planets where we detected it in a protoplanetary disk. Um, and we actually saw that it was uh, interacting with the gas in the disk. So we were able to actually see it with Alma. Um, it was like the second or third time we've been able to do this. So that, that's probably my favorite. It's around five, five times the mass of Jupiter. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. How uh, how long does it take for you to build up one image, one of one of these Alma images? That's an excellent question. Um, it it depends on how good you want the image to be. Uh, so to to make these really nice images, uh, it takes a, a few hours or so per disk. And um, that's for the the dust. There's people. I, I mostly actually study the molecular gas in these in these disks, and that takes maybe a factor of ten times longer. But to make these these nice uh, dust images, maybe an hour or two per per disk. Have you have you repeatedly observed some of these to see how, how they change over time? Yes, we have. Um, it, it turns out that there are some disks like exoplanets. There are some disks that people have favorites, and so they look at them uh, frequently to look for, for time variability. It turns out most of the least broad features that you're seeing do not change that much in time, at least on sort of human or telescope time, time scales. They look mostly the same. Um, there are a few things that, that do change in, in time. If, for instance, the star were to flare, then you would see some changing. Um, but the most, most of the distributions you're seeing stay the same but between observations. Another one? What's the range of distance uh, that you're viewing these planetary disks from? How far away are they? Yeah, uh -huh. that's, a great, that's a great question. Close. Unfo I mean, unfortunately, we look at the closest ones because if you go further away, your uh, spatial resolution, your angular resolution is going to, to get worse. Um, your angular, angular resolution is going to be the same, but your spatial resolution is going to get worse. Um, so we tend to look at things that are within like 100 to 160 parsecs, so uh, a few hundred light years uh, or so. So we're really within our galaxy in the nearest star forming regions. Um, we, these definitely aren't extra galactic. These are the closest disks that we can find. And when you talked about the dust collecting, you said it happened around the cross line. Is there a correlation between the size of the stars and what type of exoplanets are forming because of the dust cloud? Um, yes, I mean, there's definitely a, a correlation between the type of star you have and where that frost line would be, which would then imprint on the type of, of planets that you could form. Um, in terms of actually seeing that trend in the exoplanet population, um, I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. There's some confounding factors. Not everybody believes the frost line interpretation as as a way to to make the majority of these planets uh, as well. So it's a bit it's a bit contested. But at least we can say that the frost line location will correlate with how bright or how warm your your star is. 
Uh, I've got a question there. You had a graph where, or a chart where you showed uh, solar mass versus a uh, lifespan of the star. Uh, some of those huge stars have 3 million years lifetime. You couldn't even form planets around those? That's an that's an excellent question. You you could probably if you were at the so the estimates for planet formation time scale could be as quick as a million years, oh, depending oh. on on the exact condition. So you could maybe just form a planet, but then they would go supernova and the planet would definitely not survive. Um, so all of these things that we're looking at are around low mass stars or at least no bigger than you know a few times that of of our own sun. The, the massive stars, that's a very interesting question, what planet formation would look like around those really, really big ones. Uh, it's not really been studied that well. Other questions? Yeah. One more. <laughs> Just ask him, uh, you know, Alma's, Alma is excellent. In the next 10 years, what kind of technology is Steve Rubin going to work with? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, could, could you say the second part of your question again? I, I, I couldn't oh. catch it. Alma is great now. Uh, what kind of technology are you drooling over, to quote him, uh, now? <laughs> you're looking forward in the future. Like, you kind of alluded to JWST, or, you know. Yeah, um, I guess I can give two answers to that. The, the first is actually Alma itself, um, because Alma has a, a roadmap for actually for technological development. So the, the Alma 10 years ago is not the Alma of today, and the Alma of 10 years from now will be a lot better. And so they're doing a lot of uh, technical improvements. One of them is increasing the bandwidth, so the amount of frequency space you observe at a time. And so what this means is that I, I said it takes maybe an hour or two to make these images. With the upgraded ALMA in the next five years or so, you can make a comparable image in half or a quarter of the time. So we will be able to go a lot faster and look at a lot more disks, uh, or we'll be able to make even more spectacular images because we'll just get much better signal with the upgraded Alma. Um, and I guess the the second uh, the second answer in terms of new facilities, um, there are uh, I mean there's new mission concepts for doing the next big flagship like JWST, but that will probably be be far away. There's actually in, an interesting uh, balloon based experiments which are going to look in the far infrared. And if you look in the far infrared, there are particular lines of uh, HD of like the, the deuterium substituted molecular hydrogen, where you can measure the mass of a protoplanetary disk. We have a hard time actually getting the gas mass of these things. So there's going to be some fancy balloon experiments that actually measure the gas mass for the first time. Further questions? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> everything that's heavier than gas, dust, has to come from, I assume, from a supernova some, somewhere. I've always wondered how does that dust get constrained into a gravitational collapsing area after the explosion? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. So uh, yeah, everything all right, comes from the, the supernova, everything that's heavy. Um, and it's essentially this cosmic cycling process, right? We have the supernova go off frequently because the massive stars don't live that long. And then they just get flung out. And at some point later, they'll coalesce into the molecular cloud that you see. So like that Taurus molecular cloud. And only at some much future time, you will have slight over densities. So something will trigger uh, the collapse in those over dense regions. So in the, the movie I showed you, um, you actually saw like a shockwave propagate through the cloud and then little bright patches appeared. Um, you could imagine in that cloud, you have another supernova, the supernova shockwave comes in and actually compresses the molecular cloud. And so it makes certain regions dense enough to actually start collapsing um, because they got compressed just a tiny bit. Uh, but it, you basically have to appeal to, to long time scales, right? So a supernova goes off and then you can wait, you know, hundreds of millions of years or so for that material to get fully ejected, fully cooled down, incorporated into a big molecular cloud. And then it's in the molecular clouds that the collapse will happen. But it, it takes it takes a long time for that actually to to do this cosmic recycling. Okay, questions? One more. One. Uh, here in Arizona, we have, a, on Mount Graham, we have a sub-millimeter uh, observatory. Are, is that the same kind of thing, or are you, are you, are you aware of that observatory? 
Yes. No, I've actually uh, just last year I've used I've used that telescope. Um, yes, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, you, it's observing in the very same wavelength. So people say millimeter, or submillimeter. That that's very much the same uh, wavelengths that that I'm, that I'm showing here. The only difference there being that that's a single dish. And so it's not so good for making these highly, highly resolved images, right? It's, it's, you can't actually see the protoplanetary disk itself, um, but it can be used to map, say, molecular clouds. Um, people use it all the time to map out the large scale molecular clouds, but not so much for, for protoplanetary disks, just because it doesn't have that resolution. Any more? Going? <laughs> All right, well, we want to really thank you for such an excellent presentation. Well, th I th thank you for, for spending this time with me and being able to, you know, give me the opportunity to share some of these these fascinating new new results. Uh, thank Thanks to all of you. Um, and um, hope you have a good rest of your night. All right, thank you. All right, well, take care, everybody.